Hey, get your Bible. Once again, turn to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in chapter 35. Uh, I had told Tanya, she texts, I texted her yesterday. I said, we're going to try to look at one through four. And so I had, that's what Tanya put in the bulletin. But we're not going to make it that far. We're going to try to look at verse one together this morning. We originally thought we would try to look at all, all four of those. We're not going to try to do that today. We'll, we'll try to bust it up over a couple of weeks. And uh, I thank the Lord for this uh, because this is something urgent, I believe, on our part. Of course, we know that God is writing about the life of Jacob. He's getting ready to, through Jacob and his descendants, bring a Savior into the world, the Savior. But there's so many things that you and I can draw from this as, there, as they are examples to us according to the New Testament, which is what Paul wrote, said the Old Testament was written for our example. And uh, I think this is a great example for all of us. It's something we all must have in our mind. And it has to be, uh, and it really centers around this, not only physical but spiritual obedience, making those two things one. And that's what we're going to focus on. So let's stand. You, let's have prayer together. And then we'll look at this verse together along with some others uh, from other parts of the, of the Bible. But uh, let's, let's just have prayer and ask God to help us this morning. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to study your inspired and infallible word together. God, we thank you as a church family. We know that's what it is. We've not come together to discern whether we have your word or not. We've come together over and around your word. God, and we pray that that word will go in us. It'll work on us, and Lord, it'll be shown through us. And Father, we also pray that we will take it out into the world and share it, the gospel to the lost, the riches of the gospel to the saved. And, Lord, that we would have growth, not only in our lives, but in theirs. God, please, let us respond. Let, <coughs> let the devil's work be stomped out in our lives this morning. Yes. Yes. And let obedience come to light. Yes. Lord, let, the, the, let what is taught, what is said, resonate with us. And, Lord, let our hearts be soft enough to receive it. Amen. Lord, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You be seated. Let me review a few things from the last couple of weeks, and then we'll get started uh, on some things. But for the last three weeks, we have been studying where Jacob was in Shechem. Remember, Shechem was not only a place, but a person. But we're talking about the place this morning for now. For the last three weeks, though, we've been studying about Jacob being in Shechem, the place. It is thought that he spent upwards of 10 years there. I'm really not sure how long he was there. That's what some people believe. Uh, he went there and he bought a piece of property, uh, according to chapter 33, verse 19. And this was a careless decision on Jacob's part. And this careless decision brought heartbreaking consequences. God help us to consider the consequences of our choosings. Okay. You see, while they were in Shechem, the place, Jacob's daughter was defiled. Chapter 34 tells us this. Not only was she defiled, but she was kept captive by her defiler, according to 34.26. Two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, plotted and carried out their revenge against the one who defiled, along with many others, of their sister. They were the full brothers of Dinah, the daughter of Jacob who was defiled. And they took their revenge. They did this by killing all the males in the city, uh, by killing Shechem, his father, also by taking their women, children, and possessions as spoils of war. Uh, they used circumcision that was meant to be a sign, a covenant to Israel, that they were God's covenant people uh, under the Abrahamic covenant. And they used that as a ruse. They used that. They taught these men into doing that, the men of Shechem. And on the third day, when they were so sore, they could not defend themselves. Simeon and Levi went in there and slaughtered them and took their possessions. But, you know, Jacob's family has forsaken the Lord. 
Not only a name. You know, and, and we noted this in chapter 34, the name of the Lord isn't mentioned one time, and that's worth noting. We noted also in chapter uh, 33 that Jacob is not called Israel one time. Very significant things. But they also not only forsook him in name, but in obedience. They forsook God in obedience. <coughs> I said all of that to say this, and to ask this question really. Where do you go from here if you're Jacob? He has been scheming instead of trusting God. And by his disobedience, he has placed his family in harm's way, both physically and spiritually. Where do you go from here? That's the question. You know this family is broken. You know Jacob's heart will never be what it once was. When we get, when we're going to go and study another book for a little while, then we're going to come back to Jacob and we're going to see uh, one of Jacob's sons he thinks is killed, which is Joseph, which obviously he's not killed. But Jacob's never the same after he thinks that. But there's just things that happen that were never the same. Some of them we caused. Some of them are is just things that other people cause. And some things are just part of life. And we deal with those things accordingly we will as we come to them. But these things right here, Jacob is to blame. There's no doubt about it. He was supposed to be in Bethel according to the word of God. But he is not, he didn't go from, remember he had, he had spent 20 years in Paden Abram with Laban, his uncle. He was supposed to leave there and go to Bethel and to where his father is. That's what the Bible says. We'll reference that in just a moment. But he didn't do that. He went to a, another place, eventually making his way to Shechem, where he spent what that commentator believed to be 10 years. Now, I don't know how long he was there, but he shouldn't have been there a minute. And that's the way it is with disobedience. So I'm just going to run in and out. Never works that way. Never works that way. But let's get to it. I, but I want to say something before we get to verse 1. It's very important. I want you to hear this from a, a pastor's heart. I love you. I want you to hear this. Because I just don't want us to be a bunch of people who are physically seem obedient. I want us to be a group of people, a church family, that are physically and spiritually obedient. Amen. Spiritually obedient that results yes. in physical obedience. That's Christianity. That's a believer. That's what a believer looks like. I want to say this and share this with you. And I think it's very appropriate in the church world today. I, and I want us to notice this from Jacob's life. I want us to notice that Jacob does not just go to Bethel. We're going to see that in this in just a moment. He does not just go to Bethel and everything is all right. Okay? He's not just going to pack up from Shechem, go to Bethel, everything's fine. There'll be some other things. He'll build an altar. He'll address his family. We're going to try to cover all that this morning. There's just no way. But he's going to do other things. He's not just going to pack up and go to Bethel. And physically being there, and there alone, wasn't going to make him right. Something, some things have, have to take place in the heart, in the, in the mind of Jacob, in the emotion of Jacob, in the will of Jacob. And also physically, but not just physically. I hope that makes sense. Today, uh, you know, today we, we think you can go out of fellowship with God and other believers and just, and just come back physically to the place where you have been and everything is alright but there are some things that must happen spiritually before there is true fellowship with God and God's people again Amen, Amen. Amen. Wow. today we, we we confess being where we Today we confuse being where we where we are physically with being there spiritually. And there cannot be that confusion. 
Jacob could have said, I'm going to go to Bethel where God told me to. Everything's great now. But that's not true. These spiritual things and physical things work together for obedience. If you were doing one plus one equals two, you would do uh, uh, these spiritual things and then these physical things plus these physical things equals obedience. That's the equation I'm working with in my mind. Let me give you an example. When, when people have been disobedient to God's command to be with the church, this is a church building, but we're the church, right? Yep. When, when God's people have been disobedient to God's command to be with the church, and then when they finally do come, they head right to the choir. They think that because they are physically where they should be, that they are spiritually where they should be. Those things are not true. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. right. Really. Preach it on. I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to be a blaster of you. I'm telling you this because I want us to come to an understanding that just because we sit in here doesn't mean we're any closer to the person who didn't show up this morning that professes to be a believer. But they are not, they may be physically here, but not spiritually where they ought to be. I, I tell you this because only you know, though. Only you know. All I can see is the physical. But you have to know that there are some spiritual things that must be made right before those physical things ought to be done. Amen. And that's what God is calling us to. You sit there and you say, with a hard heart and not receive this, it will be to your own demise. It will be to your own destruction. You will choose perhaps to go to Bethel like Jacob did. But you must choose not only the physical, but you must choose the spiritual getting right as well. We can stay and shake them for a little while, but the consequences are horrible, spiritually speaking. But I, when you come to Bethel, it's not just physical, it's spiritual. Don't think everything is all right because you come into the church building. That's, That's true. Amen. Very true. I'm asking you, please, yes, for your sake, for your lost family's sake. Yes. For the worship of Jesus Christ, the honor of God's sake. Yes. To get those two things right. Amen. Amen. To get those two things together. You remember God wasn't mentioned in chapter 34. Look at verse 35. Chapter 35 verse 1. What's it say? And God, the very, the second word in the English text is God. It's going to be ten times or so that the name of God is going to be named in this chapter. And here's what we must remember when we're going from, from disobedience to obedience. When we're going spiritual plus physical equal obedience. When we're going from that, here's what we must remember. We cannot get things right without God. Jacob couldn't have gotten right. He had disobeyed God. He had gotten away from God. He doesn't name God. And now it's God. And God front and center. When people say, when I get things straightened up, I will get back to obedience, such as being at church. We'll just use that as an example since we're on that. That's not true. That's wrong. When I get things straightened up, I will get back to obedience. Does that sound right to you? That's backwards. That's exactly backwards. Let me tell you what we are essentially saying when we make that kind of a statement. We are saying that we are going to be disobedient to what God says in His Word and hope that this wrong path will get us back on the right path. When does that ever work? It never works. That's right. It never works. This is a person. Listen. 
This is a person who has fallen into the trap, the snare of Satan himself. That you can do it mentality that the church has got and the world has got and, that, and it's been brought into the church because that's our thinking. No, God can. Mm -hmm. That's who, that's what we think. We yield to him and God can. Right? Yes. Not I will and then I'll go to God. No. Yield. Let him. Amen. It, but it's, it's being caught in the trap of Satan. It's operating in the strength of the flesh. Using the so-called wisdom of the world. Of this world. To get our lives right. There's no way this will happen. And, you, and, and things will subside in the life. Because they quote unquote handle them and then they'll physically come back. But spiritually they're as far away as they ever were. There, there is a person that's, that's fallen into this trap of Satan, is operating in the strength of the flesh, using the wisdom of the world. Notice verse 1 though. And God said unto Jacob, you said, you're going to stop again. I'm going to stop one more time right there. <laughs> this is the grace of God. I would have kicked Jacob out. I said, look what you've done to my name. Look what you've done to my plan. Humanly speaking, look what you've done. But it says, and God said unto Jacob, if this is not grace, I don't know what is. Because after everything that has happened, God calls Jacob first. You say, how does he call to us? You say, and people get in obedience. They say, well, God never spoke to me. Yes, he did. That's right. Amen. Yes, he has spoken. And this is all he's going to speak to you with. This is it. You're out of obedience to God and you're waiting for him to come to you in a dream. You're waiting to wrestle with him like Jacob. Listen, he's already spoke to the people of God. The Word of God. Amen. The Word of God. You don't need anything else. When you conquer this, maybe you move on to something else, but I don't have to worry about that. We're always going to be studying it, and it's always going to be working on us. Well, they'll say, well, he just didn't come to me. Listen, he already came. But he's coming back, and you're going to have to stand before him and give him an account. Right. Not of whether you're saved or not. You settle that now. But on what you've done with that salvation. The choices you make. And if you just chose to be a physical person, but not get your spiritual side straightened up. So, if this is not grace, I don't know what it is. But I want to tell you that this. That same grace extends to us. And I'm so grateful for that grace. I'm so grateful for it. I am, I, I, I just, I'm overwhelmed by it. And I don't even understand it to its depths, really. But I'm still overwhelmed by His grace. Look after the comma there. It says, said unto God, and God said unto Jacob, comma, right after, uh, Right after that. For he said unto Jacob, Arise, comma, go up to Bethel. God still wants to use Jacob in his plan to bring salvation to man. And God is going to fulfill his promises to Jacob. Remember, back in chapter 28, God said, I'll, you're going to go there and you're going to come back. Listen, God made that promise. He was going to come back. Now, I'll tell you what, Jacob comes back to me a little bit of uh, kicking and screaming, but he's coming back. He, he, uh, he may have said, I'm going to settle down right here in Shechem. And God says, no, you're not. I'm going to bring you back. And I don't know how the Christian, the professing Christian today thinks, I'm going to live out of God's word. Everything is going to go well, and God won't do a thing. I'm not saying he's sitting up there with a uh, with his ready to strike you immediately. We're talking about the grace of God. If that commentator was right and Jacob was there ten years, what grace? 
What great, ten years. You think about David when he, when he lays with Bathsheba. A year goes by before David makes things right. That's the grace of God. You say, well, it's been ten years. Don't rest on your ten years. Yeah. Don't rest on your tent. I'll tell you what, somebody said the secular saying is this, your chickens come home to roost. And friend, they will come home to roost. I ate all mine. <laughs> <laughs> Arise, go up to Bethel. God still wants to use him. God has made those promises to him. God is going to fulfill them, no doubt about it. Bethel is where Jacob was supposed to be. Chapter 31, 13 lets us know this. He's supposed to go to where his father was in Hebron. Uh, when he left his uncle Laban and paid an Abraham, this is where he was supposed to go. So God, by his word, calls Jacob to where he's supposed to be. Where, where does God call us from? People today are waiting for some audible voice, but he's already called from his word. He's already called. When someone tells you, here's the deal today. When somebody tells you that God is all right with your disobedience, get away from that person. That's right. That's right. They will often do this by misusing the phrase, God loves you. Uh, the phrase is true. You and I trusted Christ. We, we, he loves us, no doubt about it. But however... The way they use it says that you can stay in your disobedience because God loves you. And because he loves you, this is what they're getting at, he will not do anything. But that is not true to Scripture. God says in his word in Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, he says, And ye have forgot the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, Think about the relationship we have with Christ, with God, with children. He says, My son, despise not the chastening or the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, or, or, or you know, he, he disciplines, and scourgeth, or whips, every son whom he receiveth. I'll tell you what, God's not went left. Amen. He's not liberal. He still whips his kids. He still whips his kids. I, I believe the person who receives this misuse of, of the phrase God loves you to mean that God will leave you in disobedience receives it at their own destruction. Their own peril. That's what they operate under. And they heap on themselves destructive choice after destructive choice. Until it is a cesspool. And then they think, well, how did I get here? This is why it's so important to have biblical truth. Amen. Amen. In your pulpit, in your life. Yes. And, you know, here's a person who supposedly knows God, yet does not obey God. And they are not confronted by God in any way. What do you think about that? What do you think about this that's running around today that calls itself Christianity but can absolutely live decades without any repercussions, without any discipline from the person who says everyone he loves he disciplines? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, you know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, verses 7 and 8, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons for with sons. What son is he whom the father chasteneth not? What son is he that the father doesn't discipline? Listen, all believers are imperfect. I, I don't want you to get the idea that, that I'm something that I'm not. I, I, I understand that. I am imperfect. All believers are imperfect. We all need discipline. We all need training. All true children of God are chastened at one time or another by, in one way or another. What do you think, though, about the Christianity that never experiences this? The quote-unquote Christianity. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 12, 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, A -L -L -L, 
then you're bastards and not sons. You're not what you say you are. That's right. That's what he says. That's what he says. If you live in disobedience to God and God does not discipline you, this can only mean one of two things. Here's the first one, and there's no way it's true. No way it's true. God's word is not true. This will be the first. That God has said this in Hebrews, and it's not true. There's no way. It, it, God's, this, it can only mean one of two things if we're not disciplined by God. God's word is not true, and he does not discipline those whom he loves, even though he says he does. And he does not deal with us as with sons, that he, like he says he does. Or number two, here's the second one. Or God's word is true. That's always the right answer. Amen. Amen. And we live in disobedience without interference from God because we do not belong to him. The salvation that is present in the church today is no salvation at all. It looks like the world. It believes and lives like it. But when you get to biblical salvation, you get a new heart. That's right. Amen. You say, I may live imperfectly. Yes, you will. I guarantee you will. But I'll tell you, God will call you out of it. Why? Because he hates us, no, because he loves us. Yeah, yeah. He loves us. God help us to get out of our mind that everybody's ready to go. Let us get out of our mind that everybody sits in here and up here are ready to go. Let us get out of our mind that everybody who's blown through this church in Amelda is ready to go. That is no way true. That's right. Amen. But only you know. Only you know what your heart is like. Some of you may be gritting your teeth and saying, I might whoop him after the service. You'll have it to do. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to die off a church pew and go to hell because God never was real to you. Amen. You were uh, physically something, leading something in the church, but spiritually you're as cold and dead as the rest of the world. Amen. Preach him, Lord. Come Preach on. Bless him, Lord. Bless Come him. on. Yes. Listen, I, I'm going to say this. Yes. And I've said it so many times, it's got gray hair on <laughs> You talk to people, they're going everywhere but church. Right. Let me tell you why. They're either... They either need to repent. They're saved and need to repent and get right. Physical and spiritual equals <coughs> obedience. Or they need to get saved. Amen. 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 That's right. It's true. The salvation you see at every age in Campbell County, the salvation you see upon most is no biblical salvation at all. And I want to tell you, one day though, you're going to wish that you knew the Lord. That's right. Amen. And if you're saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, one of these days you're going to wish you knew about that salvation. People will call you to their bedside and you're honored to be there. But listen, you can't be taken through a doctrinal course. There's no time for it. You say, well, we don't, I don't much care for doctrine. We do. Amen. The Bible does. I'm telling you, you're going to want to know. You might have dinner on your mind today, but one of these times, you're going to have spiritual matters on your mind. And you know what the problem is? You won't have any answers because you don't know the Word of God. Amen. Or, even worse, you get your theology from things you've heard people say. Yeah, there's no danger in that at all. Sarcasm. Okay, that's sarcasm. There's all kind. We live in the Bible Belt. People can talk the talk. Don't worry about the walk. Just ask me about my church. I'll tell you about it. 
I may not be able to name the pastor or the name of the place on the sign, but I'll tell you about it. Anyways, let's go on. I want to show you something about him, about Jacob here. I'm sorry to get your hopes up that we was going to do one verse and you was going to get right out of here. I, I wasn't trying to get your hopes up. <laughs> I, I was going to do the other three verses with it, and I thought, we'll, we'll be there tomorrow. But anyway, look right here. Did you know that Bethel is, is at most 30 miles from Shechem? You, you read different commentators. There are all these mappings. and They're not sure where the cities were exactly. Uh, some of them say it was 30. Some say it was 15. Uh, one map I had said it was around 22, I think. I, I can't remember. You have those atlases, you know. But they think it's around 30 miles. Either way, 30 miles, we'll say at the most. For years... Jacob is 30 miles at most from at least physical obedience. 30, 30 miles. Jacob and his family were no more than 30 miles from disobedience and blessing. From obedience and blessing if they would get right physically and spiritually. Swap that around spiritually and physically. But it might as well have been a million miles because almost obe obe obedience, almost obedience, and almost blessed is neither of those things. Right. Let me tell you what it looks like today. This close but no cigar kind of saying here. Let me tell you what it looks like today. It looks like being at church some, but not responding to God's word. If Jacob would have just went to Bethel, he would have been no better. There had to be some spiritual response. We'll see it in just a moment. Close but not quite doesn't count. Then someone asked that person, you'll be out uh, and somebody will ask you about the church or ask me about it, uh, you know, or something like that. But they'll ask the person about the church and they'll say, you go to church? Oh, yeah. I go to church. I go to such and such church. And they talk this good game, but God's word has not been allowed to do a work in them for years. They're in Bethel physically, but spiritually they're a million miles from it. Their heart's still in Shechem. Because they're spiritually 30 miles away from blessings. But they will not obey God's word. God told Jacob to go to Bethel. Notice what he says next in verse 1. And dwell there. Do you see that in your text? And dwell there. Jacob is to get where God wants him to be physically and stay there. People talk about sin as though it is God's will for them to die. Well, I'm a sinner. Well, yeah, you are. I am too. But we have so many tools to overcome it. We have a new heart, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, so on and so forth. Amen. Listen, we're not fighting, as one preacher said, for victory, but from victory. Yeah. But it's a daily grind, no doubt. But, they're, but they won't not respond to God's Word. 30 miles. I, I just can't believe it. But he says, go there and dwell there. Jacob is... Jacob needs to be there physically and stay there. But it's not God's will for us to be in sin. Don't let anybody push that over on you. It is actually God's will for us to live holy, obedient lives. It looks like spiritual, physical, equal and obedience. I thought of, when I was thinking about this, I thought of 1 Peter. I thought of 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 14 through 16. Listen to what he says. Listen to what Peter writes by inspiration of God. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Talking about how we live before we get saved. He calls it former lusts and ignorance. 
Verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written that he quotes Leviticus. Be ye holy, for I am holy. What was Jacob to do, though, when he got back to the place of obedience? Was it just a physical thing? Absolutely not. Look at your Bible. It says... Uh, in verse 1, it says, and we'll just start at the first, but notice what it says. And God said unto Jacob, this is the first of the verse, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, here's the spiritual, and make there an altar unto God. Make you an altar unto God. <coughs> this is the spiritual side of it. Jacob, Jacob tried to worship God while being disobedient. You remember that? He built an altar in Shechem. Chapter 33, verse 20. But now he's told by God where to put his altar. And that he was going to use it for worship. How many times you think in those years he was there and you think he went to that altar? I wish it told us. But it doesn't. Church, addressing the church, us. You and I cannot worship God by living in unchecked disobedience. True. And I don't want us to get the high and mighty thought that, look at me, I I'm about to float out of here. I tell you what, examine yourselves. Amen. Examine yourself, Samson, as the Word of God instructs us to. Examine myself. Many in this room have not had any kind of real worship in years. Let me tell you what I mean by real worship. It's based on spirit and truth, not emotion first. Right. Yes. That's right. Not a stirring up by some song first. I'm talking about you read the word of God. It may have sparked the memory of a song, but God, the worship rose from you to God. Amen. I tell you, real worship is always through the Spirit and the truth. That's good always, doctor, good always, always. If you have to have a scene to worship, think about where you're at. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Think about that this word right here and the depth of its truth about God and you now that you've been saved, sanctified, justified, ready for glory, that these things can't stir you. Where does that put us? He puts us in a place that, that we are physically obedient and so we need something emotional to move us to get us quote unquote worshiping. Listen. Let the truth and the Spirit of God be the thing that, that causes your worship to ascend because that's the only thing that will. It's the only thing that will. I can't even remember where I was. But listen, we want to be holy. But he says, he reminds him of who the God, who God, who the God was that he is going to worship. And if you look down through this, he says, remember we read that where he says, and make there an altar unto God, the one true God, you know. And so there's no mistake, notice what it says, starts with the word that, that appeared unto thee, talking about Jacob, when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And he is speaking of the events that took place over 20 years ago that are re-recorded in Genesis chapters 27 and 28. The world today would tell us that God, not Jacob, needs to change on this, right? They'll say, look at that old mean Old Testament God. I'm glad he changed. He didn't change. He will never change. That's right. He cannot change. He's God. Amen. He was working out a plan in the Old Testament. He's working out one today. And the things that happen and do not happen are in accord with that plan. But everything God says will happen, will happen. That's right. 
Uh, he says, when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. That's what he's, events tw over 20 years ago he's talking about. The world say, hey, let, let God change. God doesn't change. That's the end of the verse. Let me tell you what somebody said about this. You say, I'm kind of ticked, really. That was, that's not the goal. That's not God's goal. God's goal is for our heart to be soft and receive what's being said. And if what is being said is not received in a positive way, the heart needs to be checked. Amen. Somebody, somebody wrote this about the difference between chapter 34 when Jacob was in a place he shouldn't have been, things were happening in his family that shouldn't have been happening, and so on and so forth. But here's what somebody said the difference is between chapter 34 and the chapter we're studying this week, 35. Here's what they said. Moving from Genesis 34 to Genesis 35, and it's because of spiritual and physical obedience. I put that note in there myself. It's like going from the desert to a garden or from the emergency room to a wedding reception. The atmosphere in Genesis 35, this person said, is one of faith and obedience, and the emphasis is on cleansing and renewal. This is the difference. This, that's the end of the quote. This is the difference, though, that awaits us when we respond to God, spiritually and physically, to obey Him. You go from, as this person said, like from the desert to a garden, like the emergency room to a wedding reception. But I'll tell you what, nobody will make you respond. You can, you can be physically a part of it, but only know what you really, really know. We, you know, people, you can have some ideas, but only you really, really know if you're spiritually a part of it. You ought to make that right today. You ought to say, I'm done with this foolishness. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this Christianity that doesn't change anything. I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior and get the real thing. Maybe you're here and you say, Samson, I've been saved. I'm a Shechem person. Or maybe you just left and went to Bethel like Jacob, but physical is all you've been. Listen, why not get spiritually right with God? Yes. What does that look like? It looks like knowing and doing this word. That's what it looks like. It looks like a changed heart that wants to do it. That's what it looks like. You say, Samson, I've got to get there. Let me tell you what, the same grace that was available to Jacob is available to you. Alice is going to come and play. I want to invite you. Stand. Come up here. Pray wherever you want to. Let, let's take care of it. Let's, let's, take, let's make our lives something that honor our God and our Savior. Let's, make us have, let's have a church that honors Him. Where we love each other. Love the truth of God's Word. We love Him and therefore we love others. You know, kind of that, that kind of flowing. Come on. You say, Samson, I'm lost and going to hell. Trust Christ as you say he is. You understand your sinfulness. Understand he died for you. Understand he rose again for you. He turned from your religion just because you're physically present. What's that mean? Really nothing. Turn to Christ and trust Christ. Please. Please. Alice is going to play. And as she plays, you do your business.